Amen. Amen. A blessing to be here with you all uh, today. I see we've got some guests in the room. Can we make a little bit of noise for the visitors and guests that we have with us today? Very glad to have you. Very glad you chose to worship with us. Very glad to continue uh, in our year of biblical literacy. We're getting started in a book called The Book of Ruth. Uh, today we'll be looking at chapter one today. Let me say this to you. When we talk about this being the year of biblical literacy, one of the things we want to do is resource you all uh, with Bible study tools and things that will help you uh, with just the different kinds of, of literature that are in the Bible. The Bible has multiple kinds of literature. You want to approach them a little bit differently. So what we have at the host team desk or host team table as you leave today is a copy of this. It'll give you a little bit of information about uh, the, kind of the, the kind of literature that we're in as we work through the book of Ruth. And I think it also you'll find it to be very helpful. Uh, also, if you, are, if you have not already done so, We'd love for you to go to MidtownBiblicalLiteracy.com at some point in the near future. Again, MidtownBiblicalLiteracy.com. We've compiled a bunch of Bible study resources, things that we think will be helpful for you along your journey as you look to grow uh, in biblical literacy this year. All right, if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and make your way to, to Ruth chapter 1. Uh, again, Ruth chapter 1. The book has four chapters in it. We'll be in it for four weeks, one chapter uh, per week. This is a very unique book. Uh, that will be in the book of Ruth. Uh, it is. It was very uncommon at that time in the ancient Near East uh, for there to be a, a, a very prominent book uh, where the main character or the hero in the story was a woman, especially since she Ruth was not a woman of great prestige or wealth or prominence in her life. On top of that, this is a, a, a story, a book that was written to the Hebrews, to the, to the descendants of Israel, the children of Israel, and Ruth was a foreigner. She was a part of a people group that the Jews didn't get along with, generally speaking. Yet this book about this non-Jewish woman and how she followed God has been read aloud every year by many Jewish people during one of their major, major festivals uh, called Pentecost to commemorate God's provision for his people. It's a story of danger and suffering and heartache and, and friendship and romance and devotion to God, and ultimately God showing up and providing in the most unexpected ways, in the most unexpected of times. Last week, I preached on God's presence in our suffering while we looked into the life of Joseph, uh, and we'll see more of that in this story uh, as well as we get a look into Ruth and her family and her extended family and the suffering that they endure. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, reads, In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So as we talk about the year of biblical literacy, one of the things I want to try to do is kind of point a few things out that might help you in your understanding of the, of the Bible along the way. Uh, a lot of times in the beginning of a story, just like many other stories, the Bible is going to give you the setting and some context for the story that's about to take place. It's going to answer questions like the when, the what, the where, the who, and the how. So this tells us the when. It says, in the time that judges ruled, if you're familiar with the book of Judges, you know that it was a time when God's people were never really consistently following him. Oftentimes they would turn away from God and turn to idolatry. Then there would be some kind of suffering that comes into the land and God would use it to try to bring them back to himself. Then eventually they would cry out to God and, and worship him again. And there would be this time of peace and prosperity until they turned away from God. And in the book of Judges and in the time that this book is set, when the judges ruled, that was a continuous cycle uh, that continue to, uh, to take place among God's people. Verse 1 also tells us about the what that is happening. It says that there's a famine in the land. Now, in our day, in our time, in our place where we live, that probably doesn't mean a whole lot to us. To them, a famine was devastating. It was, it was catastrophic. They're, in, they're a society that lives off of the land. They need the land to produce crops every single year for them to have food, for them to maybe even be able to have some type of financial wealth if they're engaging in trade. A famine, so I'll try to give you a little bit of an example to help you understand how, how big of a deal this is. Uh, so being in an election year this year, a lot of people have a lot of uh, maybe fear or maybe anxiety, concern, or whatever it is about who's going to be the next president. The, the, an election year doesn't, doesn't compare to the gravity of a famine that's taking place. If a famine takes place, my children might not eat. This is the level of concern that's taking place. So we see it's in the time of the judges. God's people aren't following him in the way that they should. And also there's this threat of starvation that is there. The first verse also tells us about the where 
that this has taken place. A man whose family was from Bethlehem, which is in the promised land where God took his people, he is now taking, because of the famine, his, his family to Moab. Moab was a group of, the Moabites were a group of people that were looked down on by the Israelites, by God's people. They were outsiders. They were pagans. Uh, many despised them. Let's continue reading verse 2. The name of the man was Elimelech, so that is the, the, the husband that, that took his, his wife and his children uh, to the Moabites. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of the two sons were, I can't say those words, and they were Epaphrites, Epaphrites uh, from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. So it tells us about the who, it gives us the names of the people in his family. So again, there's this suffering that has taken place. Elimelech leads his family to Moab where there is no famine, which sounds at the time like a really good idea. We don't have rain here. We live off of the land. Let's go somewhere where it's actually raining so that we can eat and have food for our family. It sounds like a great idea and a great plan for him. But what you might not be aware of is that in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and Deuteronomy chapter 30, God had explained to people what's actually taking place when there's a famine in the land. And he told them before they got into the promised land, if you turn to idolatry, if you do not worship me, if you do not continue to follow me, a famine will come into the land. When that happens, you should see that as a cue to turn and worship me. You should see that as a reminder. We need to be worshiping God. We need to turn away from whatever sin this is. We need to worship God and God will bring rain to our land. This is what God was calling them to do. The famine was to be a reminder, to be a prompt for worship, for turning away from sin and turning to God. So instead of Elimelech and his family saying, you know what we need to do? We need to turn away from sin. We need to worship God. We need to call our people to worship God. They leave. They leave instead and said, instead of trusting God and what he's saying, we're going to leave and go to this farm people. We're going to leave the place where the temple is, where God manifests his presence more than anywhere else. And we're going to go to a foreign land where they worship different gods, different false idols. And that is where my family will be. This famine was supposed to be an alert, a reminder to turn back to God. But Elimelech used it as a prompt to leave the promised land that God had promised to their people. There's three points that I want to make today in this message, three different ways that people in this, in this passage, in this text, in this chapter today respond to suffering. First, we'll look at Elimelech's response. His response to suffering was compromise. His response to suffering was compromise. The suffering of the famine was meant to remind God's people what life is truly all about, which is following and trusting and worshiping God. It was to turn them back to God. Instead, Elimelech leads his family to move away from the place where God had given them so that they might worship him, freedom from the influence or forces or pressure to worship other false gods. Elimelech led them away from the people who were aware of the true and living God and were aware of his words to them. And instead of leading his family to repentance, he led them to a place where basically no one knew the true and living God and no one was worshiping him. The suffering led him to compromise on what God had called him and his family to. So last week I talked about how we often use our suffering to justify our sin. Today I want to talk as much about using, not just using suffering to justify sin, but rather when sin just seems to make sense. When doing something that goes against what God calls us to do just seems to be the most reasonable and rational thing to do in the situation I find myself in. It's the thing that makes sense because what Elimelech led his family to do seems to make sense. No rain, no food over here. There is rain and food over there. Let's go over there. There's a famine in the land, so going somewhere else makes sense unless God instructed you to do otherwise. When there are responses to suffering that would make sense to those that don't follow God, but they go against what God calls us to, if we engage in those responses, we are practicing compromise. Some of y'all's favorite verse, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. I think for some people, when we talk about this verse, we think about it in terms of if God just, just whispers to us out of nowhere, seemingly something random that he's telling us to do that doesn't seem to make sense, we should still do it. And I think there's room for that. But let me, I, I believe this verse primarily is talking about when the word of God does not align with your reasoning, when the word of God 
does not align with what you find to be the best decision to make. You are to trust God with your entire being, with all of your heart, and follow him even when it does not make sense to you. Even when deep down it seems to you like it makes more sense to not obey God's word, this trust, this, this verse tells us, excuse me, to trust him with all of our hearts, with everything we have, with our entire being, and not trust our understanding of how things should work over God and his word. It means to trust God with all of yourself more than you trust yourself. It means to trust God with all of yourself more than you trust yourself. Let me give you an example. Uh, Proverbs 23, 17 says this. It says, let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. Let not your heart envy sinners, but continue in the fear of the Lord all the day. In times of difficulty and suffering and trouble, it feels like it will make sense to be envious of those who aren't following God, but, but seem to be having the type of life that you desire. That seems like it would make sense. God, I'm following you. God, I'm doing the things that you are calling me to do. I'm making all of these sacrifices for you. And yet they have this and I don't. And yet they have received this blessing that I have been crying to you for that, they don't, that I don't have. They seem like they have so many things that I want, the material things, the relationships, the experiences. God, I'm going through suffering and they seem to be doing so well. For us to lean to our own understanding would be to be envious of them. But to trust in the Lord with all your heart is to say, I know that someone else might have many things in this life that I don't have. But there is a gift, but there is no gift that they have received. And there is no treasure that they have that is greater than the gift and the treasure of God sending his son and saving me from my sin so that I can know him. Trusting God with all your heart is knowing that if you have Jesus, you always have more than anyone who does not have him. Also, probably, don't, don't spend so much time on TikTok and Instagram where you see everything that everyone has that's making you envious of them. That's another sermon. I ain't going there today. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> Elimelech, Elimelech compromised in his time of suffering. Naomi, enduring suffering for a longer period of time, responded in a way that is very deep and profound and painful to see. So I want to focus in on what Naomi does and what her response is. Let's get back into the text, verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons, so she's now widowed. Verse 4. These took Moabite wives, talking about her sons. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, but both Milan and Chilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Naomi's suffering is difficult to put into words. She loses her husband. She's already moved away from, from her family, from the things that she was familiar with to the things that she held dear to herself. Then she loses her husband, so she's left with her two sons. Her sons get married, and then both of her sons die. She's now left without her husband and her sons. I can't imagine her grief. I can't imagine the pain, the sorrow, the sadness that Naomi is experiencing. I can't imagine the anger that I will assume she has. And on top of all that, there's likely a fear, a feeling of lack of security that she has now. Because generally speaking, the, the retirement plan for grown-ups was having sons or, or grandsons that could take care of you, especially in that society where much of the earning power was, was held by men. So for many women at that time, getting married and having sons was a means of security because it means they had someone to provide for and advocate for and protect them. So on top of all the pain, sorrow, sadness, anger, and grief, there's a lack of security a lack of protection that's there now as well. She's likely experiencing what many would refer to as compounded grief or cumulative grief, where, which is where before you can fully process one loss, you're hit with another one. And these losses have a huge, huge impact on Naomi. Verse 13, this is her talking to 
her daughters in law. No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. So Naomi's saying that she's going to go back to her family, go back to her people in the promised land. Her daughters in law are saying, okay, we're going to come with you. And she says, no, don't do that. She said, the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. <clears throat> we'll jump down to verse 19. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women, and the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, do not call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. You see, the name Naomi means pleasant. The name Mara means bitter. She says, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. That is who I am now. That is how I see myself. That is now how I define myself. Verse 21, I went away full. <clears throat> this is Naomi talking. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? The second response to suffering in this passage is bitterness. The second response to suffering in this passage is bitterness. The grief, the pain, the sorrow, the loss, the hurt, the suffering has changed Naomi. Now, there are at least a dozen times in the Bible when someone's name gets changed. Every other time that I've been able to find in the Bible when someone's name gets changed, it's someone else changing their name, usually God. It's God telling Abram, you're going to be Abraham now. It's God telling Simon, you're going to be Peter now. It's God telling Sarai, you're going to be Sarah now. It's God telling Jacob, as we talked about earlier, you're going to be Israel now. This is your new name. This is the only time that I can think of when someone says, I'm changing my name. She says, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. Don't call me pleasant, call me bitter. She now feels defined by this bitterness. When she considers who she is and her life, she identifies with her bitterness as much as anything else. And when she thinks about God, she identifies him as someone who has dealt bitterly with her. This suffering has not only changed her view of herself, but her view of God. She says the Lord has brought calamity against her. The Hebrew term for brought calamity means to hurt, to spoil, to do evil against, to punish, to break into pieces, or to afflict. There are a lot of people, a lot of Christians, who over time have turned cold towards God after seasons of ongoing suffering. I think it's often unintentional. I think over time, you just begin to trust God maybe a little bit less. You feel like God didn't answer your prayer, so you begin to pray a little bit less, or maybe a lot less, because what's the point? You prayed for the illness to go away. You prayed for your loved one to take a different path and turn to Christ. You prayed for the marriage to stay together, and at this point, as it stands, it has not happened. You pray for more progress or more success in your endeavors. You pray for your relationships to be at a different place. You pray for yourself to feel better by now. And at this point, it has not happened. And it's affected your spiritual life and your walk with God. Maybe you know that God is calling you to come to him with all of your emotions, your grief, your pain, and your disappointment. You know that's what God calls you to, but you don't because you just don't feel like it. Or, or maybe you, you just feel like your prayers have gone unanswered, so you don't know what the point is anymore. Family, I'm a pastor that's preached on this kind of thing at least a dozen times, if not more. And I relate a bit to Naomi. Now, I, I, I wouldn't say at this point I'm in a place of bitterness, but I would say that there have been times in my life, if I could have a, a transparent moment, even recently, where, where I felt a resistance to prayer because of a season of suffering that I've been in that I hadn't felt before a resistance, something in me that's like, I don't want to go to God with this again. I don't desire to go to God with this. I've been here. I've been on my knees about this. I don't desire to do this anymore. If I could shout out a good brother in the faith, I do appreciate my life group prayer partner, uh, Jared. He's in Kid Towns. He's not here right now. Um, I told him to check the podcast. Uh, I appreciate him challenging me and questioning me and encouraging me to not give up in prayer. 
to continue on in prayer in times when I found it difficult to do so. It was such a blessing to me to be questioned in the way that he questioned me, to be challenged and encouraged in the way that he challenged me. You know, I find it to be telling that the text shows that Naomi is saying a lot of things about God, but the text doesn't show her saying a lot of things to God. A lot of things to say about God to others, to her daughters-in-law, probably to uh, the people in their hometown of Bethlehem when she gets back. Doesn't show her saying a lot of things to God. And I just want to tell you that that, that, that that pattern of behavior makes your heart and your mind a safe place for bitterness towards God to grow. I need you to hear me on that. Saying a lot of things to people about God, about how God has, has dealt with you this way and how God caused this to happen or God allowed this to happen, things that you don't like or different suffering that's been in your life. If you are in the practice of saying a lot of things like that about God, but not saying a lot of things and expressing your heart and your emotion and casting your cares on him to God, your heart and your mind has now become a safe place for bitterness to grow towards God. Your heart and your mind has become a safe place for resentment towards God to grow. It's the same thing for other relationships in your life. You got a close relationship with somebody, they, they, they sin against you, they offend you in some way, and you don't go and talk to them about it, but you're going and talking to everybody else about it, and they're affirming everything that you're saying about this person. What's going to happen in your heart? Your heart is becoming a safe place. Bitterness can grow unthreatened, unchallenged, unrebuked, unquestioned in your heart. Might we be a people? that knows that God calls us to cast our cares on him because he cares for us? Might we be a people that can look to the word of God, specifically in the Psalms, and see that those who were leading God's people in worship were continuing to go to God angry, sad, grieving, disappointed in God, whatever they were feeling at the time, pouring that out to him. It can be easy for us to allow our suffering to lead us away from God. But as I said earlier about Elimelech, well, or, or earlier I should say when I was talking about the famine, the purpose of the famine was to lead God's people back to him. That was the purpose. He calls us to cast our cares on him. I know this is a really difficult thing to do. And one of the things that helps us is to have examples of people who have gone through the pains and difficulties of life and still remain faithful to God. And that's what we'll see in our third point about suffering. The third response to suffering in this passage is being an example of faithfulness. Being an example of faithfulness. Let's jump in. Verse 6, Ruth chapter 1. This is talking about Naomi. This she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Bethlehem is in Judah. Verse 8. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. So Naomi's decided to go back to her homeland. She's heard that the famine is over, the harvest has come, so she's headed back. She tells her daughters-in-law to go back to where they came from and live with their families. Hopefully they'll be able to find husbands there, they'll be able to take care of them. But they tell Naomi, no, we're not going, we're not going back. We want to be with you. Verse 11. But Naomi said, this is the second time she says this, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that, that they may become your husbands? So she's thinking about how, we, I want to make sure you're taken care of. You can go back to where you are, hopefully find a husband so that you can be provided for and taken care of. Verse 12, turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? grown? Would you therefore remain or refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly better to me for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. You can still hear what she believes about God. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Naomi tells them, no, it'll be better if you just go back, go back to your homeland, find a husband there. You'll be able to be taken care of. 
Orpah listens to Naomi and returns to her homeland, but Ruth stays with her mother-in-law, Naomi. In this time of difficulty for her, Ruth is like, I'm staying with you. Verse 15. And she said, now she's talking to Ruth, and she said, see, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, notice this is important, and to her gods, return after your sister-in-law. Don't miss that. That's actually a big part of this story. The nations were associated with their gods. Oftentimes, if you lived there, you're going to worship the gods that that nation esteemed and worshiped. She's like, can't you see what what your sister-in-law has done? She's going back to her people, going back to their gods. Verse 16, but Ruth said, do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you, following you. So Ruth says to her mother-in-law, Naomi, respectfully, don't tell me what to do. <laughs> respectfully, my mother-in-law, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me to leave you and go back to my homeland. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Important part right here, your people shall be my people. Your God, my God. She's saying that the people of God, the community of God, the family of God will be her people. She is committed and devoted to the people of God, and she is committed and devoted to the one true and living God now. Notice that in verse 15, Naomi said that Orpah has returned to her people and to her gods, plural. But Ruth says, your God, singular, will be my God. She is saying, I don't want all those idols anymore. I want the true and living God. I want the God that I've learned about from being a part of your family, Naomi. I want him. Naomi, don't tell me to go anywhere else. The true and living God is my God, and his people are now my people. See, in her bitterness, after all the suffering that she had endured, Naomi is telling Ruth and Orpah to turn to their idols. Naomi is saying, hey, Hopefully, you'll likely be able to find a husband. It'll be better for you. Just go back, to, go back to your homeland. Continue to worship those idols. That'll be better for you. This, this bitterness deep inside Naomi is causing her to lead or, or tell or urge her daughters-in-law to not even follow God. This bitterness is taking over her. She's okay with them not following God or the God that she believes has harmed her. Verse 17, Ruth says this, where you die, I will die, and there will I be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. She's saying, I want to be with you to the end. And she's saying, if anything but death separates me from you, may the Lord kill me and cause me to die right there. Ruth is like, I'm not having it. She is going to stay with Naomi, and more importantly, with the God of with God and with God's people. Ruth is an example for us of faithfulness in suffering. She's lost her husband. She's probably also experiencing fear at this time. She's saying, I'm going to stick with with Naomi, even even though she knows Naomi doesn't have anybody to provide for her at this time. She's an example of not turning to compromise. She's an example of not turning to bitterness. See, I've talked about how we can allow suffering to lead us away from God, but I also want to make sure we notice that suffering can also lead us to God. Suffering can also lead us to God. Notice, consider this, consider this from Ruth's point of view. Why does Ruth meet the family in the first place? Suffering. The famine is how she met them in the first place. What is the reason that Ruth ends up going back to Bethlehem and back to the land of Judah? Because of the loss of Elimelech and her husband. Suffering. Suffering is actually the thing, twice, and multiple times in this passage, it's the thing that leads people away from God. It's the thing that leads people, or at least Ruth at least, to God. Ruth is an example of faithfulness because she saw her pain as a prompt to turn to God. I'll be honest, as I was reading this, it made me think about how Three of the four people that were baptized in our church last year, my conversations with them all pointed to times of suffering that led them to place their faith in God. Three out of four. Ruth is a woman that stands before us as an example of faithfulness to God in times of suffering. And as I was reflecting on that, it came to mind that we have a number of Ruths among us in our church right now. We have a number of of women that have gone through real, often intense suffering and have still remained faithful to God and turn to God in the middle of that suffering and trusting him. 
Many of y'all know Brenda. I texted her this morning and asked her if I could use her as an example in the sermon today. Knowing the difficulties that she's dealing with with her health, I asked her if I could use her name. Here's what she said. She said, absolutely. My story is such a testament of the Lord and his goodness. It's nothing about me and all about him. He shows up so faithfully when we just trust him, even when we do not understand. Catch this. My faith is stronger because of my trials. So that Jesus, she, there, there's, a, there's a strength. There's a perseverance. There's a, there's a grit to her faith now that is there because of the trials, because of the difficulty, because of the suffering. The, the, the mature, the faithful believer, when we encounter suffering, we, we respond in a way we say, I'm going to use this as a prompt to lead me to God, to lead me to worship God, to allow me to, to trust God in a way I've never trusted God before. I think of our sister Kelly, who's with us today. I remember, Kelly, I'm not going to look at you. If I do, I cry. I remember uh, being in the hospital room. And I don't think I'd ever been in a hospital room with somebody who their eagerness to talk about the goodness of God was greater than their body's physical ability to allow them to do it. And I'd never been in a conversation with someone who was having difficulty breathing, but couldn't stop telling me about how good God had been to her in those moments. Examples of roots in our life are powerful and needed. Can I talk about another sister in our church? I think of our sister Janice, who, who after, after much grief and sorrow, I feel like half of the Sundays when I see her and ask her how she's doing, I had to come and be with the saints. I had to come to the presence of the Lord with the people of God. No matter what I'm going through, I just had to come and be here on Sunday and worship today, no matter how difficult it is. There are more that I could name. There are roots among us who trust God and don't allow suffering to cause us to practice compromise and who at the same time aren't cold or bitter towards God, but rather shine as examples of faithfulness before us, among us, and around us. To the roots that are with us today, whether you're a man or a woman, I want to encourage you and let you know that you're a blessing to us. That your faithfulness, if you're in a time of suffering today, your faithfulness, your, your courage, your desire to continue on and seek the Lord is a blessing to us every single time. When you practice faithfulness towards God while suffering, you inspire us to follow God faithfully no matter what comes our way. And there will be suffering that comes towards all of us. We need this encouragement and this strength from each other as God gives us comfort. The roots among us, you teach us that the good news of our Savior is more powerful than the bad news of our suffering. You remind us of verses like Romans chapter 8. I'll just read a few in Romans chapter 8, verse 35, which says, you, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Jump down to verse 37. No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God or from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Family, when you live as a Ruth amongst a community of believers, you remind us of one of Ruth's descendants. Because if you're not familiar, Ruth is one of the great, great, great grandmothers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our crucified and risen Savior who didn't allow his suffering in his life to lead him towards compromise as he lived a perfectly righteous life. He didn't allow the, the, the bitter pain of the cross that he would endure to cause him to have bitterness in his heart toward his father. But instead, he suffered with great faithfulness, trusting his father through it all. Families, we partake in the Lord's Supper today in just a moment. May we remember the Lord's faithfulness in his time of suffering. May we remember his, his ongoing devotion and commitment to the Father as he endured great suffering on our behalf.